merger. We'll see if the basketball scandal could really derail that. Plus, a deal, a big one at Newark's airport, a new ad campaign for Atlantic City, and an about-face for Senator Menendez. All ahead on NJ Today. Major funding for NJ Today provided in part by New Jersey manufacturers, auto insurance, and more for New Jersey Business and Industry Association members and their employees. New Jersey Association of Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njar.com. Verizon, communication solutions designed for the people and businesses of New Jersey. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. The Star Ledger and NJ.com. And by PSENG, serving customers, strengthening the business community, and investing in New Jersey's future. Now stay tuned for NJ Today. From the production studios of Montclair State University, this is NJ Today with Mike Schneider. Hello again. They were the words that have a lot of people wondering these days. The president of Rutgers University, the man under fire for his handling of the basketball scandal, the man who was really brought in to oversee the Rutgers merger. Did he really say that the scandal could perhaps jeopardize that huge politically charged issue? And is that the reason why Governor Christie has made it clear that he's standing by his man? We asked our chief political correspondent, Michael Aaron, to find out. There may be several reasons why Chris Christie is supporting Rutgers President Robert Barchi, but surely one is that he needs Barchi to complete a complicated university merger plan by July 1st. This is the largest merger in higher education history. Rutgers is about a $2.2 billion institution. UMDNJ is a $1.7 billion institution. This is practically a merger of equals. From a balance sheet perspective, it's a huge undertaking. And I have absolute confidence in Bob Barchi. Um, uh, and I believe it's one of the reasons the Board of Governors hired him in the first place. Barchi told reporters yesterday, moving the state's medical school into Rutgers and its osteopathic school into Rowan University remain his focus. We are working very, very hard on the merger. And I believe we have um, a clear timeline and line of sight to um, a closing in, in July. We have excellent people working on it. It's a very, very large and complicated project. Uh, and uh, we will continue to do our best to, to make that happen. I don't think that the issues that have come up today will derail that process unless we, lay, we, we let them take our eye off the ball of, of finishing what we've started here. It uh, has been described as the most complicated exercise of its type uh, in this country. Assemblyman John Berzicelli says Barchi and Rutgers better not take their eye off the ball. The business of merging these universities, merging the university and the restructuring act uh, is a matter of a law and has to be fulfilled. And uh, I think the, the president in place has the skill set to do that. At an assembly budget hearing today at Rutgers Newark, there were concerns that the merger is not funded at all in the governor's budget or that Rutgers Newark and Rutgers Camden will be shortchanged but not that the merger itself is in trouble. The scandal itself, such an unfortunate incident, gives opportunity for many different parties, faculty, students, etc., who had other grievances to now get a spotlight from the media and bring those forth. So it opens up the proverbial can of worms, uh, unfortunately, uh, but it is my belief that this will not in any way influence uh, the systematic planning that has gone on to uh, bring UMD and UMD back to Rutgers. No one we spoke to today thinks the university merger is in jeopardy, but in one way or another, the scandal surrounding Rutgers basketball might just slow it down. For NJ Today, I'm Michael Aaron in Newark. Now, our David Cruz was on the Rutgers campus in Newark yesterday watching President Barchi take a lot of heat from students and staff. We asked David to go back on campus today and check the temperature one day after. On a warm spring day, the Rutgers University campus comes to life. The sidewalks teeming with students on their way to class, enjoying a nice latte or just hanging out. It's been quite a week at Rutgers, a student body thrust into the national media spotlight. At first bemused, then embarrassed, and now getting annoyed. I think everyone's uh, pretty upset about it. You know, we, 
with the State University of New Jersey. That's not how we want to be represented. Every day, students do incredible things all around campus. We have tons of incredible research going on, tons of charitable events, fraternities, sororities, organizations that all do things that are for the good. And we feel that you know, sometimes the media only represents us in a negative light, and that is not how we want to show the world. The members of Chi Psi fraternity are out in force today, setting up for a sale of sweet tea, a dollar a cup to raise funds for charity. They were part of a group of student organizations that raised half a million dollars for charity this past weekend at an annual dance marathon. You know, our main concern was that we weren't going to get any publicity because of all this, I guess, negativity that was around campus. But at the marathon, it was the most unifying event where everyone came together for one cause. And our main goal was to show what Rutgers students really can do. Having survived the Tyler Clemente tragedy and several controversies before and since, Seniors like Guarionex Rodriguez say they're getting used to avoiding the media when they converge on campus. To come here and then focus so much on, on this on this coach, which I saw the video and I, you know, those scenes are obscene, but to be, then say that this doesn't happen in other sports arenas or in other schools or under other supervisions of different coaches or different departments, that's incredibly hypocritical of them to do that. The Daily Targum, the campus newspaper, has dedicated an entire homepage to the scandal. Amani al Katakba edits the paper's opinion page, where students have been sounding off on the scandal and the media attention. Definitely. I think that, is, especially when we take into, the, into consideration the fact that a college campus is a microcosm of society as a whole, we should be focusing on the issues that cause these types of events to happen in the first place. For much of the past week, satellite trucks and reporters in suit jackets have been ubiquitous on campus. Today, it's just us. And for most of the students we talk to, that's fine by them. In New Brunswick, I'm David Cruz, NJ Today. Several hundred Newark high school students walked out of their classrooms today, protesting the governor's proposed education budget. The students converged on the Rutgers Law School in Newark, where you might have seen before the Assembly Budget Committee was holding their hearing. The students say getting the same funding as last year just isn't good enough. In fact, they want to undo the Christie budget cuts of 2010. We would all like to tell them to vote no to the new funding formula because it completely destroys our schools. We need to increase funding to see improvement, not decrease funding and see them destroyed. Uh, millionaires got a tax cut in 2009. Corporations have gotten $2.1 billion. If Prudential, just a couple blocks down the street, can get $200 million for a new office building, why can't East High Side High School get $3 million to educate its students? And now on to Newark Liberty International Airport, where they signed a big deal today with United Airlines. United agreeing to extend the current lease for another 20 years. And the airline also says it's going to spend $150 million there, improving the concourse and the baggage handling operations at Newark Liberty. United is the biggest airline in our region. 13,000 employees in Newark and about 400 daily flights out of Newark Liberty. A new show of force that tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop is Camden, where members of the new county-run police force have hit the streets. 118 officers sworn in to the Camden County Metro Police, most of them coming over from the old city police department, which is being disbanded amid a soaring crime rate and a record number of murders last year. Our next stop is Jersey City, where engine company number two is finally back home. Hurricane Sandy left their downtown firehouse under five feet of water and blew out the electrical system. But $200,000 were spent on repairs and renovations, and the firefighters are finally back where they belong. And our final stop is Red Bank, where a parking meter is waiting to give you a call. New high-tech parking meters, the ones that will let you use a smartphone to pay and even give you a call if your time is expiring. City officials hope this will cut down on parking tickets and attract more people to the downtown area. And that's your Garden State Express for Tuesday, the 9th of April. Well, it's a do-over in Atlantic City. Officials at the Atlantic City Alliance say they're going to spend another $20 million on their Do AC advertising campaign. You might recall last year they spent an awful lot of time emphasizing all the family fun you could have in Atlantic City. Didn't even mention gambling. This new campaign is going to remedy that. It's an effort to convince or remind people that there is plenty of fun to be had in the casinos, too. Manilokeing officials have voted to spend another $3 million to repair their storm-damaged town. 
These are emergency funds, we're told, to rebuild roads, sewers, and other borough property washed away by the hurricane. But it doesn't cover the hundreds of homes there that suffered catastrophic damage. Well, this is one of the rituals of summer. Tourists heading down the shore, and along with thousands and thousands of people who happen to be searching for a summertime job. But the after effects of Hurricane Sandy, they could make that search a lot more difficult this year. Our Lauren Wonko has that story. Bartender Monica Mayoni feels lucky and relieved. Okay, it'll be okay. Still my second job. Lucky to return to work this summer at Jimbo's Bar and Grill in Seaside Heights while job seekers search for a new seasonal gig. I've had a lot of people that were like, can I just fill out an application? I want to do anything. There's people whose jobs in this area might not be existent now. And so if they see a place like this is open, they would be like, they're open. I might as well apply because there's some people that definitely won't have their jobs this season. The damaged Casino Pier will cut its workforce by 40% this summer, from 500 workers to about 300. The standard 200 employees will remain in the water park, and they may hire throughout the summer as rides open on the pier. It's hard to turn away some employees that have been coming back, but if we don't have the spots open, it's hard to cut those ties sort of thing. So we're trying to hire as much as possible, but again, if we don't know what's open, we can't overhire at the same time. Other businesses don't expect a drop in the number of job postings. I'm thinking that we're going to be um, hiring as many, looking to hire as many as last year, and we're hopeful that it is going to be busy. The largest sector in New Jersey to add seasonal workers during the summer months is the leisure and hospitality industry. The Department of Labor and Workforce Development says employment in that sector typically increases by 35 to 40,000 workers during the season, which lasts from May through September. But will that increase in employment take a hit since Sandy pounded the Jersey Shore? Some business owners say it's too soon to tell. Others are optimistic. Store owner Adam Miller expects to hire the same number of foreign exchange workers this summer, but interviews are put on hold. We're just sitting and waiting, waiting for the boardwalk to be done so we can fix the whole store. Frank Rainey normally operates his boardwalk stand on the boardwalk. He's working in a parking lot until construction is completed. I'm used to a crowded boardwalk and when you're only dealing with one third or less of the people, it's difficult because you sit for long periods of time and you know, it can be uh, disheartening after a while, but I think when the people come back, everything will be fine. But will people come back to the shore this summer? I feel like it's going to go either way. I feel like we're either going to have a successful year because everyone wants to see that has not had a chance to come down here yet and see, or it's going to be like people want to avoid because they don't know about the beach, they don't know about the boardwalk. The upcoming season is filled with uncertainties, but one thing is certain. Businesses and their employees are counting on a successful summer. In Seaside Heights, I'm Lauren Wonko for NJ Today. So what about New Jersey's hotels? Are they ready for the summer season? Joining us now from the State House, the Executive Director of the New Jersey Hotel and Lodging Association, Joe Simonetta. Welcome to the program. Well, with all this Thanks, in Mike. mind, with all what we've seen, all the damage that was done, where do your members stand right now? Are they ready? Uh, getting there. Um, they, they are working uh, f uh, feverishly to get there. Uh, there is a lot of um, a lot of unknowns. Uh, the rebuild has been uh, hampered somewhat by the slow movement of funds, although the Christie administration is really rapidly trying to get that money in their hands. Uh, it's been complicated by the adoption of the new proposed FEMA maps. There are some questions about rebuilding, raising for those properties that are now in the V zone. But all indications are that the areas of the shore that have been damaged, and we should make a point here, that not all 127 miles of the coastline saw the same types of damages. Some had none, some had minor, some had devastation. So depending upon the pockets and where you are, uh, I would say we'll be 80 to 90 percent up and running. Give me a little bit more information about what the FEMA flood maps may mean to some hotel operators. Are you saying essentially that some of them are holding off on repairs, holding off on reopening because they're worried about how well they can comply with these maps? Uh, they're holding off on repairs and holding off on doing certain things until there's clarification. And the clarification really needs to be, if you are in the new V zone, the new velocity zone, do you really need to raise it to a certain level or can you rehab, get through the season and then go back and repair? There's still a lot of unknowns uh, from the individual municipal code offices, 
I know in my own situation there was an issue in Atlantic City that needed to be clarified and I must uh, throw a uh, comment in here that the uh, Office of Recovery, the people there, uh, the staff are working, uh, they're working very, very close with the industry to try and clarify any uh, bumps in the road as far as the rebuilding goes. But some are concerned. Joe, you also uh, mentioned that some of the funds are a little bit late in getting there. What, what kind of funds are we talking about? And, and how many? Uh, some of the business. Go some ahead. of the business funds that you've heard about, uh, some of the money that the governor has talked about, and it's really not a, a delay that's happened at the state level. It's the delay of getting the funds moved uh, to uh, New Jersey from the federal government, then the process of distributing the funds and making sure the funds are used properly and the oversight and all of that. Uh, as you well know, it's a lot of money at stake and there are a lot of people that are responsible to make sure that that money is handled appropriately. I, so I assume, that Joe, that some, takes time. This, I assume that some operators basically after the storm closed up and, and will not be reopening. Is that the case? And if so, how many? What percentage? Few. Few have, few have thrown up their hands and said, I'm out. Uh, a couple people who have had offers of uh, uh, purchase of their property based upon, based upon their location have left. Uh, anecdotally, I only know of two, uh, but we don't have any really statewide statistics. Who's, who took the worst hit and who's in the best condition right now in terms of recovery? The mom and pops or the big hotels? Uh, the mom and pops. The big hotels, uh, uh, by and large, including... Uh, up in the uh, Hoboken area and uh, you know not those that are not on the coastline uh, seem to have weathered this a little bit uh, a little bit stronger it's more or less the the unique uh, um, kind of uh, mom and pop hotels the under 50 room hotels they're the ones that took the worst hit but the message is that most of them by far are ready to get going for and uh, to welcome guests for the summer well they are and they're trying fast to do that and we hope that the uh, EDA uh, will approve the $25 million that the governor has asked for to tell the rest of the world that we're ready and that we will be open for the season. Joe Simonetta, have to leave it there. Thank you for coming on, sir. Thank you. Some of New Jersey's most vocal politicians have hired new people to speak for them. Newark's Mayor Cory Booker hired James Allen to be the city's new communications director. Allen has been working in a similar capacity for a Delaware congressman. He fills a post that has been essentially vacant for almost a year. Meantime, the governor, he has hired a brand new deputy press secretary, Colin Reed, who used to work for former Massachusetts Senator Scott Brown. Meantime, we got word today that the governor and his new friend, basketball great Shaquille O'Neal, may soon be spending some more time together. The Huffington Post invited both of them to be their guests at the upcoming White House Correspondents' Dinner in Washington, along with John Bon Jovi. The Democratic candidate for governor also getting some more help. Senator Barbara Bono was endorsed by the New Jersey State Industrial Union Council. And we also learned today that a group that calls itself One New Jersey will spend a lot of money on a TV commercial attacking her opponent. This group is comprised of three Democratic campaign companies, and the Star-Ledger reports they will spend six figures criticizing Chris Christie. Well, here is something that would have been hard to imagine not too long ago. Senator Bob Menendez on Capitol Hill rising to support the nomination of federal magistrate Patty Schwartz to the U.S. Court of Appeals. I am pleased to rise in support of the confirmation of Patty Schwartz uh, to the Third Circuit Court of Appeals a nomination which has finally come to the floor and a time uh, has come to confirm Judge Schwartz and I express my full support and urge my colleagues to do the same. Menendez previously insisted it wasn't Schwartz's indirect link to an investigation of him that provoked his previous opposition or blocking her, some say. It was the way that she answered some of the legal questions he asked of her. But he liked her better after their second meeting, leading to his change of heart and leading the Senate to confirm Judge Schwartz today, 550 days after she was nominated by the president. Well, suddenly the Senate race in the 14th District has gotten very interesting. Yesterday we talked to the Republican, Peter Inverso, who's running to reclaim his old Senate seat from the Democrat, Linda Greenstein. 
And now we're joined by Senator Greenstein, who's in our studio in the State House. Good of you to join us once again. You know, Palmtaker NJ Great recently to referred to you as the most battle-tested legislator. Uh, and this is yet another competitive race, uh, according to many observers. Uh, how seriously do you take this threat? Well, I take all of the races seriously, and I think that's what Politicker was talking about. I run all of them in a very similar way. We work extremely hard. And what makes it, I would say, a tad easier is that we're always responsive to the people of the 14th. We work on that all year long, seven days a week, so that when it comes to campaign season, it's just more of the same. We've been doing it all year long. Uh, so I do take all threats seriously. I take all elections seriously. This is no exception. And you're running against a man who occupied the very same seat a while back for some 16 years. He referred to you as, as a friend, and he said he wasn't really sure if he was going to run against you, but there were some robocalls, uh, I guess some political calls that were made, which disturbed him, and he said that kind of put him over the edge. Were, were you involved with those calls? Did you authorize them in any way? Did you know they were being made? I did not. Uh, they were done through the party. Um, if I were asked, I'm not positive whether I would have authorized or not, but um, it was really more a matter of the timing than the content. Nobody has been talking about the content. We just stated some things that are going to be discussed in the race. One of them, and I'll, I'll start with that, um, I was going to start on a positive note, but I'll start with this, was about the pension bond deal. Um, for people that may not remember that, I'll try to make it really simple. It happened during Governor Whitman's administration, and I personally think it was one of the worst things to happen financially in this state. The state we not fully still funding dealing the pensions? That's correct. We're still dealing with that. All the governors have dealt with it, including Governor Christie, uh, by essentially using the pension system as an ATM for the state. But correct me if I'm um, wrong, Senator, because the governor, I believe, mm -hmm. in his last budget address said that they're closer to fully funding than anybody has been in, in a considerable period of time. We are moving closer because every year we're p doing some payments. That seemed to start with Governor Corzine. It's worked its way till now. But we're not there yet. And all of these many years, we've been dealing with the fact that our pension system almost went under. That was a fight. The fight for that plan was something that was led by, at that time, Senator Inverso. He was one of the leaders of that. He thought it was a great thing for the state. It has not proven to be great. And what it did is it put all of the pensions of all of the public workers in jeopardy. That's what was being talked about in the robocall that you asked about. Do you think so that issue is strong enough factual. With, with a governor um, who's running for re-election and has, a, according to some of the latest polls, a 40-point lead in those polls, is something like that, well, do you think, strong enough to, to either force him out of office or, or to protect your seat? Well, remember, we're not running against the governor in any direct sense, um, but I do think that that particular action on the part of the Republicans at that time, led by Senator Inverso at that time, was something that is going to resonate when we begin to explain it to people. I think it's what has put our state, in, uh, our state into a bad financial situation for all these many years. That's something that he championed. So people don't remember all the details. It is a complicated issue, but it is one that I think people will understand when it's explained to them, and I believe that the robocall just pointed that out. There's a lot of time. Um, we'll, we'll it's talk just about one small thing. We, we, it's we, just one small thing at we, that time. We're going to talk about a lot of those issues issues down the campaign trail, as you well Absolutely. know. Absolutely. But before I let Absolutely. you go, one thing struck me as I was doing research for the interview, and that is that the Republican Party in this state seems to have, as, according to some of the latest data I've seen, outraised the Democratic Committee by a three-to-one margin. Does that concern you about your party's ability to fully fund the campaigns? And, and are you comfortable with Senator Bono as the, uh, as the person on top of this ticket? I'm very comfortable with Senator Buono. I think she's an excellent candidate, but I know she has a very hard road here. Uh, I'm not concerned about the money because in every race, uh, we've always found the funds and we'll continue to find them. So I I'm not uh, concerned about that. I am going to run, and I mean this very seriously, first and foremost on my record, which is long and very positive and very appreciated by the people in the district. I have so many things that I've worked on, from ethics reform, I've worked on the tax issue, I've worked on consumer issues, protecting children, so many other things. Uh, I have a lot to show. I've taken leadership positions with many of this, uh, these bills, and um, I really think my record is full of uh, things that the people of the 14th are happy with 
and uh, I will remind them of some of the things that I've done, and I believe that they're going to be happy with the service that I've given them. Senator, we have to leave it there for now. Thank you for coming on. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, that does it for us, but coming up tomorrow, a busy program. Senator Nellie Poe will be coming by, sounding off about the scandal at her alma mater, Rutgers University. We'll find out why the mayor of Elizabeth, a Democrat himself, has such mixed feelings about the Democratic candidate for governor. Plus, we will take you down the shore, where one museum that was washed away by Sandy is struggling to find a new home, and we'll have the very latest gambling numbers from Atlantic City. Till then, I'm Mike Schneider. Thanks for watching. Have a good night. See you tomorrow. I didn't really like math until I met Mrs. Cryer. My goal is to make my students love math, and I take it seriously. It's tougher now to help every student. Budget cuts have made class sizes larger, but math is so important. So I do what it takes to give my students the help they need. New Jersey's math scores are third in the nation. Mrs. Cry made me actually love math. Our students really excel, and that makes me proud to be a teacher in New Jersey's public schools. Next on NJTV, BBC World News. Tonight on NJTV at 8, William and Mary.